Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. How are we doing this morning? And happy spring break to some of you. For the rest of us, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, many of you probably know, uh, my name is Travis. Uh, I'm the singles pastor here at Park Cities Baptist. And one of the things that I really enjoy is I enjoy reading. I enjoy reading a lot. In fact, I saw a t-shirt today that says, I read and I know things. And I feel like that's basically what I have to offer to the world. I read and I know things. But one of the books that I've, I've really taken a liking to, and I, I took a liking to it after I got older, uh, was the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And some of you have read it. Some of, how many of you have seen the movies at least? How many of you have watched like the director's extended version that lasted 400 hours? And yeah. So uh, one of the great uh, lines from that book that's not necessarily in the movie, the scene is in the movie. And it's the scene where, where the, the party has just lost Gandalf. Uh, I won't get into all the details of that it was in the minds of Moria and all that. No, you don't need to know that. But they've just lost Gandalf, and they, they go and they, they stay with um, Galadriel, who's played by Kate Blanchett. She's one of the elves, and she's one of the oldest elves, and she begins to talk to Frodo, and she says this to him, and I'll read it to you. It says, I passed over the mountains, and together through the ages of the world, we have fought the long defeat. But even now there is hope left. I will not give you counsel saying do this or do that, for not in doing or contriving nor in choosing between this course and another can I avail, but only in knowing what was and is and in part also what shall be. But this I will say to you, your quest stands upon the edge of the knife. Stray but a little and it will fail to the ruin of all. The long defeat. I have fought the long defeat. We're talking about grief and joy this morning. And if you've never encountered grief in your life, real painstaking, heart-wrenching, gut-twisting grief, it's coming. And I'm sorry if you came here for a, a message of joy in that regard, but grief is something that will come to us all. In many ways, we are fighting the long defeat. Most of life, for somebody especially that's not a believer, not a follower of Jesus, it's staving off as much grief as you can and getting as much happiness and contentment as you can. That's the summation of life for many people that don't know Christ. And they continue to fight the long defeat. And for some of you, you may feel like you're fighting a long defeat. Maybe you've lost someone. Maybe somebody left. Maybe somebody was never there. Maybe you have a dream that's never going to be realized. And for you, it feels like the long defeat. You're just trying to get through day after day after day. And grief just kind of lurks there like a shadow, waiting to take over your life. And if it doesn't, then that was a good day. If it does, then that was a bad day. Grief is something that can dominate our lives and control us. And grief can seem inevitable, both in its weight and its seeming inescapableness, right? Grief seems to be always something that is there. So what I want us to talk about today is how we might have joy in the midst of grief, because it's coming. If it's not already here in your life, praise God, but it's coming. There will be a day where if you're married, one of you probably will go home without the other one. Never to share that bed together again. Some of you will never have that person. And that will feel crushing in its own way to you, the absence of someone not there. So how do we have joy in the midst of that grief, that, that sense that something's going to go wrong? How do we have joy? We're continuing on in this study, this series that we're doing, where we're talking about from death to life, moving from things that, that seem bad or are bad, and moving to something that's hopeful and positive. So from death to life. Today is from grief to joy, and how the resurrection has lasting impact for us today, despite the fact that it happened about 2,000 years ago. We're going to be in Luke chapter 4, verse 14, and we'll, for the most part, stay there. 
And what I want us to see is that God hears your grief. He hears. But, he also, but Jesus gives, and then what do we do with that? So let's start with God hears our grief. God hears our grief. Now, I think this grief shows up in different ways, and we're not gonna, we don't have time to exhaust all the different ways that grief shows up. This is not going to be a, a three-hour-long seminar on dealing with grief, nor is it going to be a three-hour seminar on how to have joy. We're going to do the best we can with both and the time that we're given. But I want to look at four particular kinds of grief that we see in this passage. And the first is the grief of home. The grief of home. Verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. And we'll stop there. So Jesus returns home after being gone for a while, right? That's, that's, he's been out in the wilderness. He went and got baptized by John. And he also went and kind of wrestled with temptation, fasting, and Satan in the desert for about 40 days. And in both of those instances, he has come out victorious. And those two events point to the claim that he's about to make here, which is, I'm the Messiah. And those two things kind of back him up. So he goes back home to start his ministry. And when he goes back home to start his ministry, there had to have been quite a bit of heartache waiting for him on the way. Because as far as we know, his earthly father, Joseph, is probably dead at this point. The man that taught him how to be a carpenter, the very man that they will reference here, is this not Joseph's son, probably is no longer with the family. And so there's heartache there, there's grief, there's somebody missing. There's also a family waiting on him. Jesus has many brothers and and siblings, and he has his mom waiting on him. And we know also that later on in his ministry, they're going to come and get him. And they're going to say, you're, you're out of your mind. They're going to put pressure on him to slow down, to stop what he's doing. Maybe they don't fully believe in what he's actually about. And so there's grief there. He's going to be going against the family, and he knows it. Many of you have made maybe choices in your life, career decisions, things like that, that are against maybe what the family that raised you, your home, wanted you to do. You would know what that grief is like. Also, Nazareth isn't, how should I say this, the most progressive place in the world at the time. Uh, Nazareth was founded by uh, Jews that were very interested in remaining Jewish and looked down on the Gentiles around them. A lot of the communities around them were kind of Gentile-Jewish mixed, and they wanted to maintain a semblance of their own identity, and so they didn't like Gentiles very much. So Jesus goes home to his hometown where his Earthly father is dead, his family's not going to understand, and his town's kind of racist. And so he goes back home, and he starts to read. And Jesus understands that, that this grief of our home can cause in our lives. He understands loss, right? He understands that somebody is missing from home. He understands abuse, Maybe what was missing from your home was love, and you continue to grieve over that as you've gotten older. Or maybe suspicion, the grief of suspicion, where you try and tell your family, no, I'm somebody new, I'm somebody new in Christ, I'm being remade, and your family's like, nah, we know who you really are. We know what you're about, and they don't believe. You may never outrun the long-term grief that where you're from will do to you. There are scars that we might bear that are going to stay with us for a while because of our home. But God hears that and he understands that home might not be where the heart is, but might be where the hurt is for you. And he understands that. He also hears the grief of injustice. Look at verse 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. God hears the grief of of injustice. It's pretty customary for a man who was rabbinically trained, which Jesus was, to read and talk about a passage in the synagogue. That was pretty common. It's also pretty common for this to be the passage that he goes to because Jewish people that were under Gentile oppression really like Isaiah 61. They really like it. It's also pretty customary for Jesus to do something that he does, and it's kind of subtle. He splices in another verse into this. So if you go to Isaiah 61 and read verse 1 to 3, uh, it's not going to look like this because Jesus inserts Isaiah 58 into a part of it. 
And that was also pretty customary. As long as you didn't flip a page, that was the rule. As long as it was on the same page, you could mix and match all you wanted, uh, which is sometimes how we read our Bibles nowadays, I think. What's not customary for Jesus to do is to take out the part that people really liked, that Jewish people really liked in that day, which was all about the Gentiles getting punished for being the oppressor. Jesus leaves that part out, and that's like the fan favorite. Everybody likes that part. They're like, oh, he's getting to the good part. Oh, there he goes. He forgot the good part. It didn't, it's not what I thought was going to happen. Jesus does this to show that he sympathizes with all people, the oppressed and the oppressor. The word for poor here, he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, isn't just economically advantaged, disadvantaged, excuse me, but it's those who are disadvantaged because of oppression, because of a broken system. And because of a broken system, a broken system makes people either oppressed or oppressors. It can force people into those roles. Now, granted, there's choices to be made, but a broken system doesn't lend itself to that, to people being kind to one another. Jesus is saying that he's been anointed, selected by God to come and address the, agree, the grief that injustice calls in our lives. And so God hears our grief, the grief of injustice, because the Son of God incarnated and walked among, he lived in the injustice. He breathed that air for about 30 some odd years. There are many ways that, that we grieve about injustice in our society, maybe health care, taxes, poverty, racism, but all of those things, and not to minimize the injustice that takes place today, but in many ways, a lot of those injustices were way worse in Jesus' time. And he faced it. He walked among it. He dwelt in it. He breathed that air. He knows what that's like. And so God hears and understands the grief that we experience. He also understands and hears the grief of brokenness. Continuing on in verse 18, he sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Jesus continues to read saying that God has anointed him to have victory over what I'm calling just brokenness. This can look like all sorts of things in our society. War, displacement, sickness, death, all these things that sort of imprison us, that kind of hold us captive, the grief that really grips us. Those are the big ones, right? Prophets often did and, and can go and they, can, they would proclaim that the end was coming, the end of all this evil is coming, it's, it's, it's coming, it's coming, but not one of them was able to say, and I'm here to bring it about. Jesus is different. He's saying, the end is coming, and guess what? It's already here. It's me. And we'll see that a little bit later on. God hears the grief that makes us weep and wail because of the brokenness in our world. There are tragedies that happen in our world that are just accidents. Things that we see on TV and we think to ourselves, that shouldn't have happened. And often when that takes place, we look for someone to blame. How many of you heard the story, I think it was last week, uh, of a two-year-old girl in a Payless shoe store that was killed? A mirror in the store, just a mirror in a shoe store that you used to look at shoes. Fell off the wall and, and hit her and killed her. She was two. And I read that story and I thought to myself, that, that shouldn't have happened. Now maybe there was a safety issue. I didn't really get into who was at fault. I know they're looking into it. But there are tragedies like that that happen that take away a beautiful life. And we grieve over it. Now I grieve over it differently because it's not my child, but I still grieve because... I think to myself, that shouldn't happen, right? And I don't want to just outright dismiss the problem of evil, that God is sovereign and yet there's still evil in the world. We just don't have time necessarily to dig into that philosophy today. But what you need to know is that God hears that and grieves with you. And for our purposes this morning, that will have to be enough. But he also hears the grief of the grieving, the grief of the grieving. Verse 19, he says that to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The year of Jubilee is another word for year of the Lord's favor. And the year of Jubilee was an event that took place in the Old Testament about every 50 years where if you had to sell off a piece of property because you were in debt, guess what? You got that piece of property back. Be kind of cool, right? 
Or if you had sold yourself into slavery because your family was impoverished, at 50, guess what? You were turned back loose. The year of Jubilee, you were released back to your family. Now, grief is mourning over something that is lost. Whether it's been something we had and lost or something that we'll never have and have lost. But that's what grief is. And in the Old Testament, God has orchestrated an event, a celebration, where the things that have been lost come back to you. Now, as far as we know, as we know Israel never actually celebrated this. They never actually put this into practice. But we know that God hears the grief of the grieving because even before the hurts that, that the Israelites would experience, even before they were crying out and asking for justice, God implemented a party where things got returned to people. God hears the grief of the grieving. He hears the pain that you're, here, that you're going through. When you cry out to him, he hears. But it can still feel like a long defeat even with God by your side. So how do we have joy? What light is there for us in the midst of this? Where can we turn? Where Jesus gives us joy. Jesus gives us joy. Look at verse 20. And he rolled up the scroll, and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. That means they were staring intently, wondering what he was going to say. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled In your hearing, Jesus' person and his work offers us hope in the midst of of our grief. You see, the expectation of the Jews was that when the, when the new kingdom came in, when the kingdom was ushered in, the Messiah would come and take away, he would alleviate all of these problems. And Jesus is saying, guess what, that time that you're looking for, that time that you've been looking for, that the prophets have been pointing to all this time, guess what, it's fulfilled in me. It's my time. I'm the one that's going to do all of this. And the word is fulfilled. It says today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That word fulfilled is in a perfect tense, which not to get too much into Greek, but that means that it's something that happened in the past but has present ramifications. So that means that something took place in Jesus' day, so it has been fulfilled, and now it has implications and ramifications for us today, and even in Jesus' ministry as he goes on. So what I would like to do is I want to test Jesus. That may make you a little uncomfortable. It's okay. We're just going to use Scripture. I want to see if he actually backs up what he says. If he says that the, the time that we're looking for is here and it's present, then we should be able to see the four griefs we just talked about addressed by Jesus in the Scriptures. Because the kingdom has been ushered in, the first fruits of the kingdom are here in Jesus Christ, and we'll see the full fruits of the kingdom when he returns. So I want us to look at four verses or four passages together and see where Jesus offers joy in the midst of grief. Now, for the sake of time, we're not going to be able to read each passage. I'm going to give you the reference, and you can verify, check me at home uh, another time, okay? But I'm going to give you a synopsis of what takes place. The first is the joy of home restored. The joy of home restored. This is in Luke 8, verse 26 to 39. It's one of my favorite stories. Jesus sails across the sea, and he winds up in this region called the Decapolis, or the Ten Cities. And it was primarily a kind of Gentile area. And he shows up, and immediately his his sandals hits the ground, and this man comes running up to him, buck naked. He's got cuts all over him. He's screaming. He's just going crazy, and the man has not just one demon in him, but many. The demon says his name is Legion, for they are many, right? Many demons in him. And so he kind of, he, he casts this demon out, casts the demon out into a group of pigs, and it says that the man was sitting there in his right mind. I assume they put clothes on him. And he's sitting there, and all is well, and the town comes up, and they're terrified of Jesus. And they say, get out of here. And the man says, I want to go with you. The formerly demon-possessed man says, I want to go with you. You made me well. I want to go with you. And how many times does somebody ask Jesus to follow him and they don't? This is somebody asking to follow, and Jesus says, no. I want you to stay right here, and I want you to go back home. And I want you to tell everybody in your hometown what God has done for you. Not later on in the book of Luke, but in the same story, it takes place in Mark. And then later on in the book of Mark, Jesus comes back. 
to the same area, and he's greeted at the shore, not by one person, but by many people who were wanting him to heal and cast out demons. What that tells you is the man did his job. He went back to his hometown. What's neat about what Jesus does and what is hard for us to wrestle with is Jesus heals this man of his demon possession, but what he doesn't take away is the painful past that this man created for his entire home. I don't know how long this man spent naked, running around, cutting himself, and living in a cemetery and terrorizing the populace. But I imagine that there's some baggage and some stress between him and where he comes from. His family probably tried to go and get him and restrain him. He broke free. And so he has to go back to these people and tell them that he's changed. He's different. I'm new. Jesus doesn't take away the grief that all that experience has caused. But he does bring joy and he does bring restoration. The man doesn't go back to the way things were before they were, there was demon possession. There's a new beginning for him that takes into account the tragedy of his life. And God does something incredible with it. He brings an entire village around to see who Jesus really is. There's still joy to be found. The man was changed. Grief changes us. Rightfully so. It's like water on uh, hitting the rocks. It wears you down. It cuts divots in you. But joy can culminate in other people knowing Christ. This man's joy and his progressive restoration of his relationships with other people brought restoration to an entire city. That is an opportunity that grief offers us because there can be joy found in the midst of it. And so we have the joy of a home restored. Jesus is doing well so far. The joy of justice renewed. The joy of justice renewed. This is Luke 19, verses 1 to 10. Also one of my favorite stories. Maybe I just did a greatest hits album of Travis's favorite passages. That's what we're doing here. This is the story of Zacchaeus. And what do we know about Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he, indeed. And he was also a tax collector. And he climbed a sycamore tree to see Jesus. Jesus sees him coming down the road and says, hey, I'm going to eat with you today. Come down. And Zacchaeus is so overwhelmed by the attention and the affection and the grace of the Son of God. He says, Lord, if I've stolen anything from anybody, I'll give it back fourfold, and I'm going to give a portion of my possessions back to the poor. And Jesus says what? Today salvation has come to this man, man's house. Zacchaeus was a horrible human being. He basically ran a pyramid scheme. That's what tax collecting was back in the day. You collect what you need to collect for Rome, and you collect a bunch of other stuff because that's what you get to skim off the top. And you also get other people to do it, and they kind of feed into you, and then they recruit more people, and so on and, and, and so forth. It's shady stuff. So when he says, if I've stolen anything from anybody, what he's really saying is, and I know I've stolen stuff, so I'm going to have to give a lot of money back. It's quite a sacrifice. Here's the thing about injustice, because Zacchaeus is right in the middle of injustice. He's taking advantage of an unjust system. Injustice is a joyless circumstance. Nobody receives joy from injustice, certainly not the oppressed. But let's think about the oppressor. Kind of the, the picture-perfect oppressor of our day and age is Adolf Hitler, right? Now, you might say a lot of things about Adolf Hitler. I've heard people say different things about him. He was a, a passionate leader. He was an inspiring person. Yes, he was also a terrible human being in a lot of ways. But nobody ever describes Adolf Hitler as joyful. Even the people that knew him don't describe him as joyful. At best, he was just a private person. You never hear about oppressors being joyful. Why? Because they're paranoid. They've got to keep the oppression in place. They're afraid people are going to rise up against them. They're going to flip the system over. They're paranoid. They're scared. They're concerned. And it just gets more and more so. And so there's grief there too. The story of Zacchaeus shows us that God's offer of joy in the midst of grief isn't just for the oppressed, although it is certainly there for them. It is also for the oppressor. And this was the problem that his own hometown will have later on. We have all done things wrong to another person. We have all hurt someone. 
either purposefully or by accident. Therefore, the story of Zacchaeus is good news for you and me both. Because if you haven't hurt another person, which i fairly confident everybody has, you have at least hurt God. That's what sin is. It is, a, it is a hurting of God and oftentimes a hurting of others. And in the midst of our grief, it's easy for us to lash out, right? To be angry and to hurt other people. That's sometimes the response that we have. But often we need to turn outward and see the injustice that's being created around us and do something about that. Don't continue to play into the role of the oppressor. Elie Wiesel, who wrote the book Night, was a person uh, who survived the concentration camps, said, don't be silent. Silence is the tool of the oppressor. It only helps those who are oppressed speak out. And so the joy of justice renewed, the joy of freedom received, the joy of freedom received. Jesus is on his way to be crucified. We're in Luke 17, verse 11 to 19. He's on his way to be crucified, and on the way, he meets 10 lepers. And if you know anything about lepers, they are... Uh, sort of reserved to themselves because society wouldn't have anything to do with them. And so they see Jesus coming and they know what he's capable of doing and they say, Son of God, have mercy on us, have mercy on us. And they come up to him and Jesus says, do this, go show yourself to the priests, which is what you had to do. If, you, if your leprosy went away, you had to show yourself to the priest, the priest would have to check you out, confirm that you're good to go, and then you would be able to re-enter society. So he says, go show yourself to the priest. He doesn't heal them. He says, go, show yourself to the priest. And as they're going, they become healed. Well, the rest of them, they all get excited. The rest of them keep going on. But one man, a Samaritan, turns back and goes back to Jesus. And Jesus says, weren't there like 10 of you guys? Your faith has made you well. Go. The joy of freedom renewed. Grief can often feel like a prison. And it's just got you caught. And no matter where you turn, there's just bars on the windows that you look out on life because the bars are, are the loss that you feel, right? You can still see the world, but the world that you look at looks different. It's, it's, it's tinted in a different shade than what everybody else sees because of your grief. And so even though you have a window into the world, that window has bars on it and you can't get out and you feel imprisoned, you feel captured. But what kind of freedom does Jesus offer us? Well, what do the lepers do? The lepers have three responses that I think we can emulate in order to kind of have freedom in the midst of our grief and have the joy of freedom in the midst of our grief. One, they cry out to God. They say, Son of God, have mercy on me. And he does. They obey what Jesus tells them to do. This one's a hard one. He says, go show yourself to the priest. He doesn't say, I'm going to heal him. He doesn't make any promises. He doesn't guarantee anything. He says, go show yourself to the priest. Now, I personally would feel like Jesus just kind of blew me off right there. But they go, and they obey, and they do what he says to do, and they are healed because of it. And then the last thing they do, or at least one of them does, is they worship during their relief. Grief will keep you from doing a lot of things. Grief can be so crippling that you don't want to get out of bed. Grief can keep you at home. Grief can also keep you around people constantly because you don't want to go home because it's lonely. But nothing, grief or anyone else, can keep you from doing those three things. There is nothing that can stop you from crying out to God except for yourself. There's nothing that can stop you from asking for help. There's nothing that can stop you from obeying Jesus Christ. And if you say, well, they might take my life. Well, yes, they might, but even that is obedience. Nothing can stop you from worshiping God in times of relief. Often when we feel the relief from grief, we just run and do whatever we want, like the lepers did, the, the other nine. It's like, oh, yay, we're done. Okay, cool, let's, let's go do what we want to do now, rather than going back and returning to Jesus and saying, God, I don't know how long this break from the crippling grief I feel is going to last, but thank you for it, and may it continue on. Rejoice in the freedom that Christ offers because he offers quite a bit. The joy of grief redeemed. I'm actually going to read this passage to you. This is chapter 16 of John, verse 20. And it says, if I can find it, there it is. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. 
When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. Jesus is having kind of his last words with his disciples. He's telling him, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to come back. I'm going to be returned from the dead. And when that happens, you will have joy that no one can take from you. Our grief is redeemed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our grief is redeemed by the resurrection of of Jesus Christ. We will see him again when he returns. And when that happens, we'll have exactly what the disciples had. Joy that nobody can take away from us. No matter what loss we've experienced. Our grief is redeemed. I can't tell you that everything is going to be okay. I can't tell you that in the end it'll all work out. At least the end being this life. If you ever watched a show and, and you're really into it and then you get to the end of an episode and it says the worst three words ever in television, to be continued, right? Netflix has solved this problem for us by letting us watch like nine million episodes in a row. But to be continued, and it always happens at the end of a season, so you've got to wait till like the fall, right? When you are in the midst of grief, and it is soul-crushing, crippling grief. I want you to remember three words. To be continued. Because there's a second half of your story. There's a ne- another season coming. And in that season, the Lord returns, and it says in Revelation that he wipes away every tear. Now, I don't know if that means we forget our grief, and it's a metaphor, or we're actually still grieving, but he comes and makes it all right. I don't know, but here's what I do know. There will be joy, unending joy, joy, joy to be continued. Grief doesn't have to win. You can have joy in the midst of grief because your story is to be continued. I heard a song this week. I think Jeff has quoted this before. Uh, it's it's a, a Sandra McCracken is the name of the artist. And she has a song, and it says... Uh, this is not, it is not okay because it's not the end. And so I know it's not the end because it's not okay. It will all be okay in the end. If not in this life, it will be in the next. So what do we do until then? What do we do in the meantime? Well, we follow Jesus in our grief and we follow Jesus in our joy. Follow Jesus in our grief and follow Jesus in our joy. We're not the first person people to hear Jesus say that he's the fulfillment of this. In fact, it was his neighbor's that heard this first. So let's look at how they respond and learn what to do or what not to do. Verse 22, and all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? We need to believe his promises. You see, the uh, people in his day heard him say this and they thought to themselves, wait, we know this guy. This is the carpenter's son. Didn't he fix my table? Where does he think he's the Messiah? The, uh, the table's pretty well made, I guess, but I don't know that he's the Messiah. Isn't this Joseph's son? When Jesus comes and makes a claim that he comes to bring us joy and to heal us of our grief, it is easy for us to do the same thing that the disciple or that his neighbors did. Yeah, but weren't you a carpenter like 2,000 years ago? You don't possibly know what I'm going through right now. You have no idea what kind of hurt I'm experiencing. You have to trust in Jesus' promises. And now what I'm about to say might be a little difficult to hear. But I think there are times where our grief is so bad that maybe we can't believe. The hurt is just too great. That is when you need a community around you to believe with you. And here's the, the tough part, maybe. Believe for you. To trust for you. That's why... We harp on connect groups all the time. We don't want you in a connect group just because we like seeing a whole bunch of people here. I mean, we do. It's cool. I want you in a connect group because you might not be hurting right now, but guess what? One day you will be. And that is not the time to get involved with a bunch of people for the first time. You'll have wanted relationships with solid believers who love the Lord, who are pursuing Him years before that. Now, if you're in the middle of grief, guess what? I think connect groups are really good at triage as well. And they can come in and they can help you as well. But don't wait for the hurt to start before you start seeking other people. 
Find other people to believe his promises with and follow him. Don't focus on your own grief. Verse 23. And he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed but only Naaman the Syrian. What you need to know about this passage, or what Jesus is quoting, is that the Elijah and Elisha didn't go to Jews. They went to Gentiles. And this riles his crowd up. Jesus knows that the people in his hometown want him to put on the same show that he put on in other places, doing miracles and things like that. There will come times in your life where you're grieving. And you're going to ask the Lord to fix something, and he doesn't. But you see him fix it in somebody else's life. And that will make your grief even worse, because you'll think, what did I do wrong? Why didn't, why didn't God heal that? Why didn't Jesus take care of that? Because I asked him to, and he didn't, but he took care of that person's thing. What's the difference? I'll tell you what the difference is. The difference is the sovereignty of God. God has chosen to do something one way and not the other. You cannot look at how God has healed other people's grief and be frustrated with the fact that he hasn't healed yours. I guess you can be frustrated, but not angry with him for it. Because comparison is the thief of joy. When you start comparing yourself to everybody else and what they have and what you don't have, whether it's grief or material possessions or whatever, satisfaction will be removed from your life quicker than you can blink. So when you are grieving, go and serve other people. I think it's, it's very helpful to do that. I think it's one of the reasons why when somebody loses a person to cancer, they go and get involved in cancer raising awareness and things like that. It, it, it's because serving people and, and kind of fighting that same thing helps with the grief. I think it's a very practical reason to do that. But I also think it just helps us love one another well. Grief wants you to look in on your own self. And there's a place for that. But joy wants you to share it with other people. And so for us to do both... You have to be willing to serve even in the midst of your grief. And then lastly, don't push Jesus away. Verse 28, when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him off the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. They become really angry with Jesus and they want to chuck him off a cliff. And that does not happen. When we grieve, we try to push Jesus away as well which is crazy because he is the one person that can help in the midst of our grief. We like to ask a lot of questions, right? God, why did this happen? Why did this have to happen? Why did this have to happen? And I think that's fine. As long as you remember one thing when you're asking those questions, your questions are coming from up here, but your grief is coming from right here. And so I could, if you were going through a traumatic experience and I could sit here with a whiteboard and break down every reason why God is doing what he's doing and what he's choosing to do, It may answer every single question you have, but here is what it won't do. It won't heal the hurt in your heart because it's an intellectual question to a heartfelt spiritual need, and that is something that only Jesus Christ can address. Jesus felt the grief on the cross. When we feel grief, it is incredibly painful and powerful, but know this, Jesus felt all of the grief on the cross, and it literally killed him. All the grief in the world poured out on him, and he died to fix our griefs. Whatever grief we have caused, whatever grief has been done to us, Jesus Christ died so that we might be healed from those griefs. And so today I ask you, what grief do you have, and how can you be healed? Maybe you need to join our church. Maybe you're missing community. You're alone. And that's a terrifying place to be in your grief. Come to our next steps room and join our church. Maybe you need to get baptized. Maybe your grief is that you're following Jesus, but something's missing. Maybe it's baptism. Maybe you need to trust Jesus for the first time. Maybe your grief is what I heard an atheist say once, I don't believe in God, but I miss him. Maybe your grief is that you miss God. 
because you've never had Him. We can fix that grief today. Come and talk to us. Our grief, God hears, but Jesus brings us joy. And in the midst of grief or joy, no matter what season you're in, maybe it's both, we follow Jesus every day because that is what believers do. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Again, as we come to it, Lord, and we come to a passage that doesn't even mention the word grief, but yet all over the page is what you do and how you have done to solve the problems of the hurts and brokenness in our life. Lord God, I ask for each person that's here, if they are hurting, if there's pain in their life, that today would be, if not the end of that pain, maybe the beginning of the end. They would begin to know the joy that they have in you. I pray that you would guide them through this week, give them uh, little stop points along the way where joy is injected into their life from other believers, from friends, from family, from your word, maybe just from a beautiful day outside, and that we might have joy, joy that doesn't rest in our circumstances. And Lord God, we trust you. We trust you in the midst of our grief. We trust you in the midst of our joy. We give them both to you, and we look forward to what you will do. And we pray all this in your son's name. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.